Good morning. It's great to see all of you on this beautiful morning, or should I say uh, afternoon. Uh, we're two minutes to noon there. Uh, it is a delight to be here with you in Broward. I only had to drive about 19 minutes to get here, living over in Miami Lakes. And uh, you know, my wife, she said to me, uh, she, she felt lonely leaving the house, going to church in Miami Day. We meet down by the airport there in Miami, and uh, we rarely, you know, drive separately. And so uh, she was feeling lonely, and uh, I said, don't worry, babe, I'll see you this afternoon, and everything will be all right. Amen? Uh, she loves Jesus. All right. Okay, how does this thing work? I see Dane, the, the, the green button here. The green button. All right, here we go. There you go. Can God use me? That's the title of my sermon today, Can God Use Me? But before we uh, go ahead and jump into the Word of God, I uh, just wanted to introduce you to my family. And uh, you see my wife and my wife of 32 years. And, uh, you know, we, she still loves me. She still puts up with me and all of that good stuff. And our three children. You have uh, Sinead, our oldest, uh, soon to be 30 on the left, with Chelsea graduating two weeks ago in the center, and Isaiah, my son, is on the right. And uh, we are empty nesters now. The last one came off the payroll last week. I am so fired up. I mean, imagine 30 years of of sacrificing and saving and college tuition and, and, and uh, what do you call those things that you go to recitals and soccer games and this and that and the other. And now it's all, it, it culminated with that child in the middle last week. And she got a job too, a really good job. I, I know you were waiting, you know, some of these kids are boomerang kids, you know what I mean? You send them out and they come back, you know? And we, we told them at an early age, you can boomerang all you want to. We're missionaries. We move quickly. Until Tony listed all those cities. We will move on you and not tell you where we are. And so you can boomerang all you want to. You will be in another family's living room by the time you come back, amen? Uh, but our children, they love God. They, they, they're used to it. They, they love moving for God. They love making new friends and doing new things. And so uh, they have made being a missionary uh, very easy for mom and dad. Uh, so I, I'm limited with my time in Miami. They let me preach as long as I want to because I set the schedule. But I'm here with Brother John Brush, a good friend, and Tony, and Joe and Tom and all the great elders that you guys have here. I really appreciate the leadership of the church and our working relationship between our three counties. And so uh, you can turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. You know, this, this question, can God use me? I, I was thinking about this text in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7. It says, but, when, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. And I really do believe that this scripture describes men's ministry. I appreciate the sisters being here this morning, and but most of my comments are directed towards the men. 
but I also appreciate the women being here because you can nudge your husband when I say something that he really needs to hear, you know what I'm saying? So I can use your support there. You know, the Bible teaches us here, it says, this treasure we have as Christians is supremely valuable. It is the valuable message of Jesus Christ. But as you see the clay pot there on the image, the image represents us. We are the jars of clay. We are frail, fallible, broken human beings. Can I get an amen? amen. If you've never been broken, then keep living, you will be. If you don't think you are frail, it's, it's, it's bound to happen. Uh, most of you know, in 2010, I had a heart attack uh, while playing basketball. That was my first time ever going to the hospital. Spent six days in the hospital, uh, barely, be, if it were not for the, the uh, one gentleman, the police officer, uh, rushing to action, witnessing the heart attack. The uh, one guy did the chest compressions, the other ran and got the defibrillator. They shocked my chest. I'm here today. It, it's amazing. If it were not for those two angels, I would not be here today. And I, as I laid in the hospital bed, I realized I was frail. I was fragile for the very first time. Because I grew up playing sports. I grew up doing every activity under the sun. And I grew up here in Liberty City. And I, I left at 17 because the drug culture in Miami was too intense. You know, Miami Vice and all that stuff happening. That's the real deal. The cocaine cowboys and on and on and on. I had to get out of Miami, get out of Liberty City. And so I left. I went and got my college degree, went and worked in industry. Uh, God called me into the ministry, and here I am. But I realized something that Paul's, what Paul is addressing here, that we are perishable containers. But the priceless contents of God's word within us is much more, much more valuable than we are in terms of our physical bodies. You know, the power of the gospel. And it is our responsibilities as men and it's our responsibilities as Christians to make sure that we are sharing this priceless gift of salvation to a lost world. How do you answer this question? Can God use me? This is a question we must discover the answer to. Whether we're teen, campus, young professional, married, single, parent, whatever we are, we must find the answer to this question. If we're grandparent, empty nester, it doesn't matter. You must answer this question. And I've had to answer this question over and over and over again. You know, the text in which I want to spend most of my time is here in Judges chapter 6. Turn with me there, Judges chapter 6. While you're turning there, I wanted to share an article with you. This article describes, it's from Australian Psychological Society, and it discusses five things plaguing Christian men today. And I believe we have the same issues here in America. Number one, men don't know what a man is. Can anyone define what a man is? What is a man meant to be and to do? Within the church, biblical definitions of male identity and headship have been misused and abused to the point where many churches won't even go near the topic of biblical manhood. Number two, men have greater demands on their time. As recently as two, two generations ago, family roles were straightforward. Men went to work, women looked after the kids. Now, men are looking after the kids and women are going to work. Things have changed. There's confusion. Number three, men are crippled by sexual temptation. Temptation to sin exists long before the internet, but the age of the internet has made sin, in particular pornography, very, very prevalent. One man writes, the internet is, is, you have icebergs of filth floating through every house on Wi-Fi. What it must be like to be an adolescent boy now with this kind of access to porn. 
It must be dizzying and exciting, but it's corrupting in a way that we can't even think about. Men are exposed to pornography from, to pornography from a young age. 12 years old is the average. Covenant Eyes tells us 64% of Christian men say they view pornography at least once a month, with pornography being the topic of 20% of all searches on mobile devices. Number four, men are too easily pleased. Over coffee recently, a man reflected to me that his conviction that men are in great need of self-sacrificing, God-glorifying, life-shaping purposes, a mission to give, to their, give their lives to. C.S. Lewis puts it, far too many men are easily pleased with the things of this world. And number five, Men don't have friends. Finally, research continues to reveal the, the dire state of male relationships. Research by an organization called Beyond the Blue discovered 25% of all 30 to 65-year-old men had no one outside of their immediate family they felt they could rely on, they could trust, they can open up their fears to, they could talk about their weaknesses, they could really just bond and connect with. You know, I love to golf, my favorite. And when I moved here four years ago, I said, I need some friends. And one of the brothers in the church, he pulled me in. He goes, you like to golf? I go, yeah, I like to golf. And uh, it was in April, and it start, the weather was changing. It was getting hotter and hotter. And so I went out to golf with him. And while we were golfing, you know, moving from New Jersey, it was, you know, you have nice spring temperatures. In Miami, you sweat like crazy. And to, after 30 minutes, you're sapped of your energy. I could barely hold the golf club, and I just wanted to quit my golf game. And they told me, just hold on, bro. You'll get used to it. You know, today we're friends because he asked me to just hold on. Just hold on. Stay with it. And we're good friends today. We golf all the time. I met a gentleman. He's a man of many means, a wealthy man. And I met another guy. His name is Greg. He introduced me to the previous guy. And he goes, that guy doesn't have any friends. I go, wow. You got all this money and no friends. I mean, he, he's like, I'm not talking about like he has a little money. He's got a lot of money and no friends. I said, I'll be your friend. <laughs> because that's what missionaries do. They look for friends, amen? Because I got a lot of things that I could spend his money on, amen? And it has all to do with saving souls. It's not buying new golf clubs or new golf balls or new toys or this. It's about putting money towards saving souls. I love being a missionary. And I love men's ministry. Can God use us? Judges chapter 6, verse 1. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them and their camels. They invaded the land to, to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. You know, for those of us who were not, are not as familiar with the book of Judges, this is a recurring cycle for God's people. And commentators, they, they, they count the book of Judges as the rebellion of God's people, the retribution of God's people, and then there's the repentance of God's people. And that cycle will continue throughout the book of Judges. And this is one of those cycles. And the story of Gideon is about what God is doing to rescue his people. 
It's God's purposes to redeem a people for himself. And that is what God focuses on. And most of us in our generation today, we focus on how many likes we get on Facebook or some other social media. Or if our video is going to go viral. You know, God doesn't care about any of that stuff. God wants to know in his unfolding plan of reaching more and more people, will his Christians, will the disciples, will those who follow him make a difference in a hurting and lost world? oppressed by so many different things that I don't have time to tell you about all of them. You know, when we look at the story of Gideon, it's about a man who was weak and God chose to use him. It was an, a man who understood the overwhelming task of going up against an enemy. It was a, it's, it's about a man who's, who God, in his methods, used this man to change the Israelite community. You know, in chapter 7 of Judges, in verse 2, God says this to Gideon. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands or Israel. Why boast? Uh, or they would boast against me. They would say, my own strength has saved me. Yeah, you know, it's amazing. You see a people oppressed in chapter 6 and verse 1. You see a people impoverished by their enemy. You see a people crying out to God. And God wants to save them. God wants to meet their needs. But in chapter 7 and verse 2, the Lord says, you got too many men. Because what happened was Gideon, he assembled his army. And God says, you got too many men in your army. We can already see that the Midianites in chapter 6, the Bible says there were so many of them you couldn't count them. And so Gideon mustered up his army, but God says, I cannot deliver you, or you will boast against me. My strength has saved me. You know, God's message is clear. If we are trying to be self-reliant and pull ourselves up, by our own bootstrings, God cannot deliver us. If we're trying to build this church in Broward County on our own strength, on our own talents, on our own will, then God cannot use us. You know, whenever we try to do it our way, then it pushes God aside. You know, my question for us this morning is how much is the threat of being self-reliant to us? How much is the threat of being self-reliant to us? You know, in Judges chapter 5, verse 31, the Bible says that Israel, the Israelites had 40 years of peace. And all of a sudden, you get to chapter 6, they had seven years of being impoverished because they had become independent during that time of peace. And God, the Bible consistently in so many scriptures, it teaches us, God says, I will not share my glory with another. If God is going to deliver us, then who wants the credit? Who's going to get the credit? God is going to get the credit. But if we are trying to deliver ourselves, God says, I won't have anything to do with it. Or I'll have to teach you a few lessons along the way. And that's what he's doing with the Israelites He's teaching them a few lessons. What are some lessons we can learn from the story of Gideon? Number one, we've got to fight to hear the voice of God. You know, because Gideon was about to do battle. And one of the battles that, that, that I really believe that each and every one of us must fight is the battle to hear the voice of God. Verse 7 of chapter 6. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians, and I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you, and I gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not Listen to me. You see, God had ordered the events 
in the lives of his people. God brought about this seven years. He brought the Midianites and the Amorites to discipline his people because they had abandoned God. God wanted to ensure that they learned a serious lesson here. You know, what did God do? God sent them a prophet when they cried out. You would think if an invading nation came in to take the land and to take the women and the children and, and all that you own, then you cry out to God, then God will send you a warrior, right? He will send you a, a, a military general, a strategist. He will send you, I don't know, maybe, you know, you got all the superheroes out now, the comic movies. God will send you someone like that. Iron Man, take your pick. I know there's many different choices. But God sends a prophet. He didn't send them a powerful warrior. He sent them a prophet. Well, what do prophets do? Well, prophets, they speak. They preach. And this prophet brought a word of explanation to the people of Israel. Not a word of condemnation, but a word of explanation. And he was explaining to them, this is why these things are happening to you. You know, sometimes we just want to get out of our situation without understanding how we got into our situation. Amen? You know, God sent them a prophet. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1, we must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. You know, sometimes we don't want to listen to the prophet. We don't want to listen to the word of God. We want to hear everything else or every other solution, but we don't want to hear God's solution sometimes. You know, in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 2, it says, For we have also had the good news proclaimed to us, just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not combine it with faith. Let me tell you something. When a prophet, a man of God, speaks to you, you have to combine what you hear with your own faith. Because if you don't combine it with faith, then nothing's going to happen. You're just going through the motion. And this prophetic voice to the Israelites and to Gideon was to help them to understand God's ways and God's means and how they got into the situation Therein. You know, I love what the Bible says in 1 Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 32. It says, From Issachar, men who understood the times and knew what Israel should do, 200 chiefs with all their relatives under their command. The men of is Issachar, 200 of them, came to David, the King David, as he led Israel. And the Bible says they understood the times. And they knew what Israel should do. Brothers, let me tell you something. We need men today who will be a prophet of God. Men who will understand the times our generation is facing. Men who understand the signs and the times and, and, and more than just the headlines and the tweets. But we need to know the happenings of our world, not just the events and the movements and the trends and the ideologies. We've got to understand the worldviews and that which is shaping the hearts and the minds of our children. That which is infiltrating our homes. But that's not all. Not only did the men of Issachar understand the signs, they knew how to live in light of that. And that's what a prophet does. He understands all the signs, but he also tells us how to live in light of the signs of the times. Knowing the signs of the times and how to live is the challenge for the church today. You know, what is the nature of the world in which we're living? What are the challenges our generation is facing? What are the struggles of good and evil, right and wrong? What direction is our culture headed? What is the nature of the greatest crisis that we're facing? How do I live? What do I do? You know, I really believe that we have stopped listening, or we've got to stop listening to the voices in our heads 
and listen to the prophet of God. Don't we all have that tape? We play our own voices. And Gideon did the same thing in verse 13 of chapter 6. Look at it. He says, pardon me, Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? We love that question, don't we? That if, why question. If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all the wonders that our ancestors told us about? Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. And then in verse 15, uh, Lord, pardon me, once again, Gideon said, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least of my family. Is that the tape that's playing in your head? When I ask the question, can God use me? Do you play the tapes as to why God cannot use you? Let me tell you something. God can use any one of us in this room. Any one of us in this room. It doesn't matter your education. It doesn't matter your race. It doesn't matter your bank account. It doesn't matter what your, 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 your situation was growing up. It doesn't matter. God can use you. It's amazing. When I was, uh, my wife and I, we were asked to leave Philadelphia and plant the church in Pittsburgh. I did not want to go plant the church in Pittsburgh because I didn't feel like I fit into Pittsburgh. If you notice in that list of churches Tony mentioned that I served in Dallas, you know, very mixed, diverse, urban, professional, you got, you name it, a great football team, by the way. And the Bears, you know, lived in Chicago for six years. You know, 1985, you had the champion Bears, you had the Bulls, you know, very urban, amazing city. Indianapolis, not so urban, but it was fun. Uh, you know, sometimes you get assignments you don't like. And then there was Philadelphia. You know, the Eagles, they won the Super Bowl after we left. And, uh, but that was a, you know, we, we watched the game. We prayed for them. But Pittsburgh was a different animal. And, and so we'd been leading in the church in Philly. And we didn't have a church in Pittsburgh. So they tapped our shoulders to go. And so I went online to, you know, look at the demographics of Pittsburgh. And I learned that Pittsburgh only had, like, I think 9% black people. And it was made up of all European cities and communities. And, and you know, many Europeans would come over and they would hunker down in their communities. And the few, the 9% of black people were spread out everywhere. They didn't even have their own community. And I learned this and I went to our eldership and I go, uh, y'all need to choose somebody else for this. I grew up in Liberty City. You don't understand. Maybe you should take a trip to Liberty City to see. And I was, I was afraid to go to Pittsburgh because I didn't think I would relate. And once again, I was planting a church. When you plant a church in a new city, you have to convert the people that live in that city so anyone in that city could come to your church. You don't want to just convert the 9% of the black people then you couldn't reach the Europeans because Europeans would come to the church and they would go, I don't fit in this church. You follow what I'm saying? So I had to figure out how to convert Europeans. Amen? Amen. That is what church building is all about. And so I prayed. I went reluctantly, but I prayed. And what my prayer life was simply, I went to all the major places around Pittsburgh and I got down one knee. I spent the whole night doing it. And I just got on the knee and I prayed. Went to Three Rivers Stadium. I prayed. Went to where the pirates played. Prayed. Got on and he prayed. Went to, all, went to the opera house. I went to hotels. Went to, you know, Station Square. Went to this place. Went to that place. Fort Washington. Went to all these. I just got down on one knee. I go, God, you got to do this. This is not about me. Because I don't want to be here, number one. Number two, I don't fit in here. I don't know why they sent me here. And, and number three, I'm scared. You know, Harry McDonald was converted in that church there. European, isn't he? <laughs> he married one of the sisters on the team, Veronica. And, and every time I see Harry, he's just the, he's the happiest man on the planet. You know, it, it, it's amazing how every time I see Anna Mitchell, 
she too was converted. That Anna's married to Bob Mitchell, whose you know son and daughter came from Broward. But Anna came out of that church. And then Brian and Shafir Morrison came out of that church. Brian and Shafir, they live over in Pembroke Pines, and they lead all of our sing all of our dating couples in Miami Dade. They disciple that group and do devotionals just to make sure they have dating, you know, healthy dating practices spiritually. They too came out of that church. I go, God, you can answer prayers, can't you? You see, that the time when we think God can't use us, we need to get down on our knees and let God do what God does. Amen? And, and so, can God use us? Yes, but we've got to hear the voice of the prophet. Number two, we've got to fight the enemy among us. In verse 25, we've got to fight the enemy among us. That same night, the Lord said to him, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old. Tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on top of its height. Using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down, offer the second bull as a burnt offering. So Gideon took ten of his servants, and they did as the Lord told them. But because he was afraid of his family and the townspeople, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. In the morning when the people of the town got up, there was, the, there was Baal's altar demolished with the Asherah pole beside it cut down and the second bull sacrificed on a newly built altar. They asked each other, who did this? When they carefully investigated, they were told, Gideon, son of Joash, did it. The people of the town demanded of Joash, bring your son, he must die because he has broken down Baal's altar and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. But Joash replied to the hostile crowd around him, are you going to plead Baal's cause? Are you trying to save him? Whoever fights for him shall be put to death by morning. If Baal really is a god, he can defend himself when someone breaks down his altar. So because Gideon broke down Baal's altar, they gave him the name Jared Baal. That day saying, let Baal contend with him. You know, Gideon had to tear down his father's altar to a pagan god. How many of you have that much courage? You see your parents worshiping false religion. Do you tear down the altar? No, we don't. You know, Canaanite religion was very, very political. Any attack on any, any uh, of the artif artifacts representing those gods was an attack on the government. To cut down an Asherah pole was a big deal. And to build another altar on top of it, that was even greater. And that's what Gideon had become. He had become a man of courage because God told him that I will be with you. But you know something? They wanted to kill Gideon. That's just, that's just how on edge he was. You know, I really do believe to this point, we've got to fight the enemy among us. Sometimes our children bring in unspiritual things into our homes. Sometimes, as parents, we bring in unspiritual things into our home. Somebody has got to stand up and fight and say, we got to get this mess out of the house. Somebody's got to take a stance on what's happening in the house of our Christian families that are attempting to destroy what we're trying to build as a Christian family. We got to get it out of the house. No matter how painful it is, we got to deal with that enemy among us. If we bring filth into the house, guess what? That filth is going to dictate what happens within the home. Next point. We've got to fight the enemy around us. Not just among us, but there's an enemy around us. Verse 33. Now all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the other eastern people, they joined forces. They crossed over to the Jordan and they camped in the valley of Jezreel. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and he blew a trumpet summoning the Abirizrites to follow him. He sent messengers throughout Manasseh calling them to arms and also to Asher, Zebul, and Naphtali of the Israelite nations so that they too went up to meet them. You know, it's amazing. 
God had raised up this evil army, but at the same time, he raised up Gideon, Gideon to defeat the evil that he was going to use to discipline the Israelites. God is amazing, isn't he? And, and God, when he does this, you know, Gideon, when he sees what God is doing in his life, the Bible says he blows the trumpets. He calls to arms his fellow Israelites. He stepped up. He gained courage. He rose to the challenge. A couple of weeks ago, Tony and I were together, and we were talking about how we can collaborate, Miami and, and, and Palm Beach and Broward, to keep the gospel going around South Florida. Do you realize we do not have a ministry in downtown Miami? We have condominiums just popping up like crazy. I believe, I don't know how many millions of people live in downtown Miami, and we have no ministry there. We need a ministry there. Yeah, we talked about, you know, North Broward. And, 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 and Tony, he said, man, we're talking about how to plant North Broward, and some of you are already living in Broward. And then, you know, there's, there's West Broward. There's out by the airport. I don't know if there's a ministry there in West Broward. And then you have everything south of, of Palm Beach and, and just north of Palm Beach. And, and now, being that downtown is expanding, they're moving people down to Homestead. We were down in Homestead Friday night for a wedding, and condominiums and homes are just popping up everywhere. We need more churches, but we need men and women to get out of their comfort zone who are willing to blow the trumpet and say, let's go. Let's do this thing. Let's take South Florida for Jesus Christ. Amen? We can never, ever get to a place where we're afraid, or we get comfortable. You know, I walked in this morning. This is a beautiful building. I saw this building 20 years ago when I visited Florida. Didn't look like it looks now. And it's hopping and popping, man. You guys have done a great job, I tell you. But don't let it make you complacent and comfortable. Oh, I love the word. And I, I was looking at Jason up here singing. I remember Jason was a baby. His parents grew up in our ministry in and I taught him how to sing. <laughs> but, I, but I turned my head, he found a girlfriend in Broward, Tony hired him, and now he's the worship leader. I go, Tony, how did you do that? It's God. But I love what you guys are doing here in Broward. But I wanna see God keep all of South Florida growing and expanding. Yes. Tony said, I'm a great man of faith. I was like, Tony, you said a lot about me this morning. I don't know about all that. But one thing I love is I love God and I love building churches. Last week I was in Nassau building churches. Came home, the next day I drove out to Southwest Florida with Matt Newberg, my man Matt. You know, we get together every couple of months talking about how to expand, how to build churches. I love building churches. I'm here in Broward. I haven't been to my own church in about the last three weeks, you know, because I'm traveling around talking about building churches. I just love seeing God work in our lives, building churches, so more and more people can be saved. Amen? The enemy around us doesn't want it to happen. I got to wrap this up. There is the enemy within us. There is the enemy within us. You know, verse 34, then the spirit of the Lord came on Gideon and he blew a trumpet, summoning the Abiezrites to follow him. He sent messengers throughout Manasseh. And as we read that, we come to understand what Gideon does next in verse 36 and 40. He took a wool fleece, placed it on the threshing floor, verse 36 and 37. If there is dew only on the fleece, and all the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you said. And that is what happened. God did it. God kept the fleece on the floor. What? There was dew only on the fleece the next morning. The ground was dry. Verse 39. 
And Gideon said to God, do not be angry with me, Lord. Let me just make one more request. Before you come, before I be obedient and be a missionary, allow me just one more test with this fleece. This time make the fleece dry and let the ground be covered with dew. That night God did so. Only the fleece was dry. All the ground was covered with dew. You know, sometimes when God comes to us and says, you mighty warrior, you song leader, you Bible talk leader, you this, that, and the other, you, you evangelist, you elder, you, you future deacon, you whatever. We go, but we got, let me throw out a fleece. How many of you, have, you can raise your hand if you want to. You don't have to be too ashamed to, but this fleece thing, I, don't, I just don't believe it works. I think this was special just for Gideon. That's just my personal opinion. Fleecing God. You can't fleece God. It's like putting God on a string and, you know, and start making him a, God is not our puppet. It's a little waste of time fleecing God, all right? But what you do is you pray. And then you add faith to your prayer. And you believe that God will work it out. And God can certainly work it out. He was testing God. You know, I'm afraid to test God. I just want to be obedient to God. I don't need to test God. God's been too good to me in my life for me to test him. I just want to be obedient and do his will. And if a situation isn't working out, then I'll figure out God didn't want it to work out. And if it works out great, then God wanted it to work out great. I just want to be obedient. I just want to be a servant of God. You see, the enemy within us is we have our agenda. We want to do things our way, when we want to do it, however we want to do it, and that's it. We don't want God to intervene and change our plans. You don't have to test God. God will make it clear what he wants you to do and what he wants you to be. I'm out of time. I promise the brothers I'll sit down. I'm done. I love you guys. May God bless you. Hey, thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Please like, comment, and subscribe. We are so excited about all that God is doing right here in Broward County, Florida.